if you spend 10 minutes with an older person, it's very likely that they're going to tell you that kids don't read books anymore, they spend too much time on their phone. Because you don't want to offend them, it's tempting to say that you agree, <laughs> that you're part of the good ones, you know, you put an alarm on your phone to prevent you from scrolling endlessly on Instagram, or that you manage to spend an entire day with your phone under your bed. What I now say to people who complain that kids don't read books anymore is that it doesn't necessarily mean that they are less educated. We have now so many different platforms, so many different ways to access knowledge knowledge, um, to read fiction outside of a physical book. So much that it would be unfair to judge someone's intelligence by the number of books they have on their bookshelf. Before we move on to the video, I'd like to introduce you to today's sponsor. Babbel. Babbel is one of the most renowned language learning app in the world and they reached out to me a little while ago to ask if I wanted to try the app and talk about it in the video and I'm so happy they did. I've been wanting to polish and practice my Spanish for a little while now and Babbel perfectly suits my needs. The app favors real world practical conversations, the lessons are designed by real teachers and they're rather short so you can fit them in your daily life. I typically do one or two lessons after lunch. Um, I skipped the newcomer courses, went straight to beginner one and now I'm at beginner two. I feel like I'm progressing very fast because I'm constantly reminded of what I learned in previous lessons. Babbel also allows you to book classes with real teachers, to watch videos, to listen to podcasts, to play games even, to motivate yourself to keep learning and reach your goals. I'm looking forward to spend more time on the app during my upcoming break and be able to practice with friends who are also learning Spanish. And the good news is that you can get 65% off your subscription by clicking the link in the description. So I totally encourage you to take advantage of that offer. New Year's resolutions are coming, just saying. Big thank you to Babbel for sponsoring this video and now let's go back to it. Booktube and the growth it had in recent years has been perceived by some as the book revival our literature teachers have been praying for. My favorite booktubers are Jack, Carly, Ariel and Nat. Um, their content is very inspiring, they have a passion for sharing, a passion for learning and it's so contagious that they are actually turning their viewers into bookworms, an army of bookworms. How cool is that? I mean, how scary is that? It's funny to see the similarities between the comment sections of booktubers and my comment section as a commentary YouTuber. Many people share their frustration with reading in school or in my case with social sciences like sociology, philosophy, etc. And yes, yes, I understand you. Booktube and educational channels are making reading and social sciences cool again because the medium is cool. YouTubers are usually people who've been on the internet for a little while. They understand how internet culture works, its subcultures, the language being used. Some are very funny, others are super good at editing their content, and others have created an aesthetic around their channel, and that makes you, the viewer, uh, come back. YouTube also forces the personal, and so booktube content often intersect with lifestyle content, or on the other hand, lifestyle YouTubers will get inspired by the booktube community. My favorite booktubers often include vloggy segments in their videos, or also create full vlogs in a very main character way, uh, showing how you can include reading in your daily life and we watch them for hours when we could actually be reading. But they deserve our attention, don't they? In one of their recent videos, one of their first vlogs, uh, Nat explained that they wanted to show how their lifestyle aligned with what they read and how they approach work. I've been following Nat for a little while now and got a lot of good book recs uh, from them. Um, they are sitting on my TBR list at the moment, but still. They are interested in climate issues and have delved in work-related topics as well. Another creator that I like and who's uh, exploring the intersection between lifestyle and commentary is Kristen Lear, who's made video on the life of an anti-capitalist influencer or my morning routine in 2015. As Freire... Ah, putain, c'est par contre, je sais pas. Paolo Freire. Paolo Freire? Freire? Paolo. Paulo Freire. I really want to learn Portuguese because I think it's such a beautiful language and and I'm already failing. 
as Freire argued in The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, education as we know it largely relies on what he calls the banking model of education, where the teacher fills the student with ideas and knowledge in a very vertical and um, unilateral way. On the other hand, Freire argues for a horizontal, uh, multilateral transmission of knowledge, basically a dialogue. I engage in dialogue because I recognize the social and not merely the individualistic character of the process of knowing. In this sense, dialogue presents itself as an indispensable component of the process of both learning and knowing. Bookchip managed to turn an introversion or oriented activity, reading, into a vibrant community. We can argue that the burst of booktube and book clubs in general is coherent with um, the fact that most people who could afford buying books were trapped indoors. Reading as a hobby expanded as celebrities and influencers promoted it and shared their favorite reads uh, with their fans. Now, activism also moved online. Uh, the year 2020 was characterized by the BLM protests. And while many of us still decided to go out and protest, um, all the forms of activism, online activism, what is sometimes referred to as slacktivism, flourished. Activist pages on social media created educational content in a form of an aesthetically pleasing post um, that could be easily shared. Alongside the educational content, people were also encouraged to read nonfiction, to educate themselves with books. At the intersection of the two, um, some activist pages also created those nice little posts that recommended books on feminism, uh, anti-racism, LGBTQ plus issues, politics and social issues in general. An account like So Informed really exemplifies that. Um, so Inform is run by Jessica Natale and was created in February 2020. Every day, So Inform delves into a topic relevant to what's going on in the world with facts and knowledge and book racks. It has now 2.8 million followers. So that means she grew 2.8 million followers in less than two years. I've always seen that sort of online activism in a very positive way. I still see it in a very positive way, but I happened to watch Hey It's Shay's video um, called Books Won't Save Us, uh, when I was researching this video, her video title inspired mine. And in her video, she argued that the rise of white liberals studying book clubs and reading about anti-racism didn't really translate into action, namely activism. And so I found it quite interesting to see that So Informed Spire is when we are more informed, we are more willing to take action. It brings us back to Freire's work. Commenting on Freire's book, Richard Scholl said, in fact, those who, in learning to read and write, come to a new awareness of selfhood and begin to look critically at the social situation in which they find themselves, often take the initiative in acting to transform the society that has denied them this opportunity of participation. Education is once again a subversive force. Freire also said that it is for this reason that I never advocate either a theoric uh, elitism or a practice ungrounded in theory, but the unity between theory and practice. Jessica Natale volunteered uh, during Bernie Sanders' campaign, so she's actually making an effort to connect theory and practice. The first time I used Freire's work was when I was writing my thesis on the uh, free health clinics of the Black Panther Party, because these guys, they had a list of compulsory reads that would make any booktuber blush. Alongside their daily service as Black Panthers in their respective chapter or city, so that would usually mean working for the breakfast program, the clothing program, the free health clinics, Black Panthers also organized weekly political science classes where they would discuss the books they read, uh, but also invite the community to join and uh, learn and get educated, for free by the way. So those readings and political classes were perceived as a form of self-help, um, for self-defense, but also their main purpose was to lead to action. In the case of the Black Panthers, it was advocating for the poor, the Black poor, uh, people living in poor neighborhoods in big American cities. Their discourse was directed to Black people, but they also wanted to include as many oppressed groups as possible, uh, different ethnic groups, um, but also poor white people. So now that online activism has become so widespread, I think it's good to remind ourselves of uh, Freire's works, of the Black Panthers, groups that use literacy to, to save the oppressed, to liberate the oppressed through concrete action. Now, 
I was chatting with a friend about this video and what I wanted to talk about and he said something quite interesting, namely that white liberals have a very bad tendency to romanticize poor people's struggles and achievements. We like to read books about them in the world of research, we like to talk about them as if to feel closer to them. It's hard to come to terms with that but I clearly romanticized black people's movements in my first year um, master's thesis. And actually my second year thesis was the opportunity for me to recognize that and to de-romanticize it, showing that most Black Panthers were very average people. Some of them came to the party because they wanted a revolution. One Panther I interviewed told me that the guys look quite cute and that's why she joined. And she ended up being so active in the movement. Another Panther said in an other interview that he had been bullied uh, when he was young and he liked the idea of looking cool, uh, in leather and carrying a gun and he ended up running one of the most successful free health clinics in the country. Romanticizing revolutionaries' lives only serves to sustain the belief that salvation will only come from those who suffer the most, that they naturally have to do all the grassroots work and that liberals will come along eventually when the movement starts gaining momentum. That's exactly what happened with BLM and see where we are today. As Freire argued, the liberation of the oppressed cannot occur without the liberation of the oppressor. Books won't save us, and I'm talking to myself as well. Books and YouTube videos won't save us. Yes, they empower individuals and they plant seed for future growth, but we collectively have to do more than that. We have to commit to more than that. And it definitely is a goal of mine for the near future. I talk a lot on this channel, but I think I could act more. I don't want to be the person who reads books on social issues, political issues, to feel better about myself. I don't want to frame this as a form of personal achievement. There was a time in my life where I was obsessed with reading as an achievement. I wanted to challenge myself and read one book a week uh, in English. I wanted to read self-help and saw the toxicity of this industry. All those guys uh, reading exactly what Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, uh, Elon Musk told them to read to become just like them. I think I realized how wrong and bad it actually was when I saw this video from Tim Ferriss, the self-help guru, um, talking about how he only read the center of a page um, and excluded the sites because according to him, the most important information was usually in the center and that allowed him to read one book a day or something like that, I don't know. Books won't save you, they won't make you something, they won't turn you into a billionaire and I think it applies to uh, activism as well. They can certainly give you the motivation to do something, but ultimately we have to do that thing. And by the way, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to create your own social movement and go out and protest every week. That's one way to do it, but community work can also be organized online. Working on a petition, writing an email to an official, helping a non-profit or a politician you care about with their online communication. We are progressively moving online and so it makes sense that our approach of activism also changes. I started this video talking about the intersection between lifestyle and booktube commentary content. Well, I think that what Kristen Leo has done, uh, what Nat is doing, is super inspiring. I'd love to follow and support vloggers, influencers who make an effort to adopt a certain lifestyle or show the community work they do and how it fits in their lives to inspire those who have time and energy to give to do the same. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, to subscribe if it's not done already. Thank you to Babel for sponsoring this video. Thank you to my Patreons for their everlasting support. A special thank to Joshua, Carla and James. And yeah, I'll see you next week. Salut!